The year is 1990. John Gotti has beaten his third trial since taking over the Gambinos, a state assault case, but is only dimly aware of the upcoming RICO case that will make this his last year of freedom. Lucchese boss Victor Amuso and the murderous underboss he delegated much of his responsibilities to, Anthony Gaspipe Picasso, have gone into hiding to avoid the Windows bid rigging case that will eventually take the secret Genovese boss Vincent Gigante off the streets. The man running the Colombo family for the imprisoned Carmine Persico, Victor Arena, is beginning to see himself as a better successor for the top job than the boss's son Alphonse, slated to take over when he gets out of jail. Next year, Arena will try to have himself appointed the official boss, setting off a ruinous gang war. The Mafia is being set up for another fall, and Hollywood is giving the event free publicity. The Godfather Part 3, a highly anticipated follow-up to the classic adaptation of Mario Puzo's novel and its sequel, was released that Christmas. But at the Academy Awards, it met its match in Martin Scorsese's Goodfellas a biopic of Lucchese associate Henry Hill, adapted from his life story as written by Nicholas Pileggi. Henry Hill wasn't a major player in the grand scheme of things. When he flipped in 1980, the only major mobsters he was able to take down were his boss, Jimmy Burke, and his boss, Lucchese capo Paul Vario. And when the mob saw Goodfellas, they weren't happy with its glorification of this bit player rat. However, there were reasons they had him around in the first place. In the 60s and 70s, lax security at New York's John F. Kennedy Airport made it a prime target for Mafia predation. John Gotti and Joe Messino both got their start in cargo truck hijacking in the area. Henry Hill would make his biggest move through a different angle. One day in 1967, he and a crooked Air France employee paid a hooker to spend some hours with another employee who had the keys to the airline's storage room. And while he was busy, the two made copies of his keys. They later returned to the storeroom with those keys and left with over $400,000. A decade later, late 1978, Hill was one of the middlemen between a tipster, Louis Werner, and Jimmy Burke regarding a warehouse storeroom for Lufthansa Airlines where US dollars exchanged in West Germany by tourists were stored. Werner, the only person ever convicted for taking part in what would be known as the Lufthansa heist, once stole $22,000 worth of mixed currencies from Lufthansa, his employer, on his own. But though he knew the security system of the targeted warehouse, he couldn't pull this off himself. Burke accepted Werner's intel in exchange for a cut from the job and assembled a team who, on December 11th, stole $5 million at gunpoint, setting a record for the largest cash robbery in the United States. Over the next few years, almost all of the participants in the robbery were murdered or disappeared. Most were presumed killed by Burke to prevent them from turning and testifying against him. Henry Hill wasn't one of the victims, and hadn't even been a direct participant in the robbery, but in 1980, he was busted for drug trafficking. Burke approached him with a proposition. Bobby Germain Jr., the dealer turned informant who led the cops to Hill's drug ring, was in Florida, and Burke suggested Hill accompany the hit team he had assembled to kill Germain there. Given recent history, Hill understandably suspected he was being invited out of state to be murdered himself. Not for the last time, history would repeat itself. Jimmy Burke probably suspected Henry Hill was already cooperating with police, but by making an obvious attempt to set Hill up, he made his premature fears come true. Henry Hill, rearrested as a material witness for the Stahl Lufthansa investigation, quickly made a deal to testify. He wasn't enough to bring charges for Lufthansa, but he revealed previous work with Burke in fixing college basketball games to make money gambling. Burke was convicted for this fix, 
then later on Hill's testimony for murdering a drug dealer who sold them bad coke. And Varia was convicted of arranging an on-paper no-show job for Hill following a 1972 extortion conviction. Both men died in prison. In witness protection, Hill recalled in his autobiography Gangsters and Goodfellas, he was offered a choice of writers by Simon & Schuster to put his life story in print. By far, his favorite was New York Magazine's Nick Pileggi. After a successful meeting, the two were regularly calling each other to get material for what would become the book Wise Guy, published in 1985. The book caught the attention of director Martin Scorsese, and in 1989, production of a film adaptation, Goodfellas, followed. Henry Hill, however, almost didn't live to see it. His constant misbehavior, including, by his own admission, drug abuse, had continued after his cooperation, and he had been officially kicked out of witness protection before he even finished testifying. 1987 saw Hill convicted of selling cocaine, putting him in danger of doing time in a prison general population, where a wise guy could kill him to avenge what had been done to Burke and Vario. Hill's original handler, prosecutor Ed McDonald, eventually reached out to the judge and got him sentenced to rehab. But before that, Hill's life may have been saved by another mobster turned storyteller. The mafia life of Michael Frances began in 1970 when his father, Colombo Capo John Sonny Frances, went to jail. He had received a 50-year sentence as the man who organized a string of bank robberies, a crime Michael believed, then and now, he was framed on. In the aftermath, the younger Frances was drawn towards his father's old colleagues through Joe Colombo's Italian-American Civil Rights League, and he was on the scene at the ill-fated Second Rally, where Colombo's career came to a violent end. He gave up on his pre-med studies in favor of making quicker money, which he hoped would pay for his father to be proven innocent somewhere down the line. Along with legitimate ventures, he began loan sharking, and by 1975, he'd built enough of a reputation to have himself inducted into the Colombo family. Michael Frances found his biggest racket in the early 1980s with the gas tax scam. When New York laws were changed, so collection of taxes on gasoline sales was made at the wholesale level, enterprising criminals would set up front companies they would sell their gas to, a move exempt from the tax, and then dissolve those companies after the final sale without giving the government its due, pocketing the taxes paid in advance by the pump station owners. Typically, this was done with a daisy chain of front companies between the owner and the final burn company to complicate investigations. Frances had been introduced to the scam through fellow mobster Larry Iorizzo, who had originally done a variant of the scam when tax was collected at the station level. In Frances' description of the operation, they made their money not by keeping the tax, but by never charging their buyers with it and undercutting competitors who played by the rules. And he tried to frame himself as a modern Robin Hood who helped the American consumer by passing on the savings to them. He was promoted to capo of his father's old crew and expanded operations by commandeering the gas tax scam of a Russian gangster who sought help collecting debts. With the muscle of the mafia for leverage, Frances assumed both the responsibility of debt collection and 75% of the proceeds. With scrutiny building in New York, Frances took off for Los Angeles and Florida, where some of his mob fortune went into financing films. He started his own production company in Miami Beach, Miami Gold, which produced a street gang-centered musical, Knights of the City, released in 1986. The production gave Frances a sudden injection of positive press, both for stimulating the local economy and hiring hundreds of at-risk, impoverished youth to appear in the film. Frances is popularly known as the Yuppie Dom, 
Holding an Italian honorific, the press normally saves for family bosses. And his business acumen was certified in mob history with his placement on a 1986 Fortune magazine list of America's 50 wealthiest mafiosi. He placed 18th. The Fortune name drop was, in fact, a eulogy for his criminal career. Iorizo had been convicted of fraud in 1984 for his part in the gas tax scam. But before sentencing, Frances persuaded his criminal partner to go into hiding in Panama. According to Iorizo, this was accomplished with a death threat against his son. Iorizo was quickly caught and shipped back to the States, whereupon he flipped on the yuppie dawn. Frances was indicted in 1985 and decided fighting the case was hopeless. In 1986, he cut a plea deal for 10 years imprisonment and to pay around $15 million in fines and restitution. Then, in 1989, he sweetened his deal by agreeing to cooperate with the government. But the execution of this deal was highly unusual. Rather than being shuttled into witness protection, Frances was simply paroled. And despite the expectation of handler Ed McDonald that he would be of use in the Windows case, Frances never testified against the mafioso. This lenient treatment ended in late 1991 when his parole was revoked. In no small part, because Frances never got around to paying restitution despite, by all appearances, living large. He finally got out of jail and stayed out in 1994. And one Las Vegas Sun article says he was eventually able to pay back the government 20 million. The paths of Henry Hill and Michael Frances fatefully crossed in 1987, when both were imprisoned at FCI Terminal Island. By Hill's account in Gangsters and Goodfellas, he was held there in pretrial detention when Frances became aware of his plight and tipped off McDonald, who saw the Hill's removal from general population. In his autobiography, Blood Covenant, an expanded revision of his first book, Quitting the Mob, Frances says Hill asked to be put in solitary confinement after they saw each other because Hill thought Frances was one of the mobsters who had it out for him. The most Frances will admit to is telling prison officials, after Hill asked for protection, to transfer Hill out of the facility. I said, but uh, why are you going to ship me out? I said, ship him out. He's a separation. He shouldn't be in here with the rest of the guys. If you put him back on in the yard, he's going to get killed. They're going to do away with him. I said, send him out. Turns out the lieutenant did me a solid, did Henry a solid. They shipped him out, and I was able to stay in the yard because Tem Terminal Island. And that's not the only twist Frances adds in his side of the story. When a made man swears loyalty to the Mafia, he is assumed bound to the organization until death, natural or otherwise. By the early 1990s, breaking the oath of Omerta was a known, if despised, way out of the life, and it's not unheard of for a mobster to be forced into retirement, something referred to as being put on the shelf. For a made man to just outright quit his life of crime and obligations to his bosses was unheard of. But that's exactly what Frances says he did. The Yuppie Don's tale of redemption begins in 1983. That May, he was disturbed by the suicide of one of the family's old timers, Tony Argello who had just been indicted on drug charges. The subsequent collapse of the case made his death even more senseless. Before the month was out, Frances' friend and partner in crime, Larry Carosa, was also murdered. Frances has sometimes been suspected of participation in the hit, his supposed motive being that Carosa broke mafia rules by having an affair with Frances' sister. By his own account, Frances tried to talk his friend into going on the run when he learned he was the target. And trigger man Sal Misiota also pointed to other mobsters looking to take Carozo's part in the gas business. In any case, the great Michael Frances was down in the dumps, so he decided to make a musical with his new film production company. And during production, he found himself infatuated with one of the dancer extras, a woman named Camille Garcia from LA and eventually was able to gain her attention. The 19-year-old Cammie was the daughter of an activist
therapist, who had been on the receiving end of police brutality, and Francais, who had gone to Columbo's rallies to proclaim his father's innocence, felt he could relate. She was also a devout Christian, and, though she was not inclined to date a married man, Francaise's first marriage was on the rocks, but not yet ended, she had a feeling God wanted her to make an exception in this case, for the sake of converting Knights of the City's producer. As Michael and Cammy grew closer, so did the law. Francaise had been able to hide his real line of work from her until he was indicted for participation in a loan sharking case, a case he managed to beat. Francaise's story is that Ayarizo flipped on him after he refused to go along with a violent prison break the former fugitive suggested. And the original gasoline bootlegger's exaggerated reports of their income led the Colombo family to suspect Francais wasn't paying up everything he was supposed to. The end result was a tense sit-down, as the Mafia calls its meetings, where they determine anything from everyday business to, in this case, life and death. Francais talked his way out, but he was beside himself, angry with the Mafia for looking to kill him over rumors, angry at his paroled father for not standing up for him, and appalled at himself for willingly walking into a situation that could have ended with his children, including the daughter Cammy was now pregnant with, losing their father. Michael and Cammy married in 1985, and here, Mr. Francais says, is where he started down a new path. A lapsed Catholic while he was in the mob, Francais began a tentative return to practicing Christianity, shortly before getting slapped with what he described as a trumped-up indictment for the gas tax scam. His plea deal was arranged, with the end goal of being able to return to his life with the woman he loved, and he let slip he was considering the unthinkable, breaking his oath to Cosa Nostra, and simply leaving his life of crime behind. Plans to simply do his time, earn an early release, and live his life were foiled in 1987, however, when prosecutors threatened further charges if he didn't testify against the mob-connected entertainer manager, Norby Walters. Francais said he only agreed when Walters refused to take a plea deal to save him from the dilemma of prison time or cooperating. He further rationalized that when the commission trial bosses didn't try to deny the Mafia existed, they had already destroyed the organization's code of secrecy. Besides, it was obvious, in the face of their current troubles, that life in the Mafia was a dead end. Speaking of his cooperation in later years, Francais trivializes it, and sometimes claims he was effectively coerced by prosecutors to take the stand. While it can't be said he completely avoided cooperating, it is true he never testified against another mafioso. The post-parole portion of Francaise's story puts more focus on his official baptism than his failure to pay back restitution, something he indirectly blamed on simply not knowing how to live legit. And in prison, he says, he devoted himself to studying the Bible and came to believe the stories it told were, indeed, the word of God. By his logic, the Bible was sworn testimony of witnesses to Jesus' miracles. And what makes a more credible witness than an apostle who would die rather than renounce his faith? The story of his newfound faith was out when Francais was sent back to jail in 91. The prosecutor gave it no mind as he wrote him off as a con man. And Francais's original memoirs, Quitting the Mob, were eviscerated by Entertainment Weekly as a sanitized fairy tale upon their 1992 publication. The story of the yuppie Don turning his life around was considered unbelievable. Just another racket. Well, if it was a racket, it's one that Michael Francis evidently decided had him set for life. Before his parole was revoked, Francis had been planning on staying in the entertainment business, but by the time he was back in jail, it was clear his plans, which at one point included a CBS miniseries based on his life, weren't panning out, and he didn't know what he would do on the straight and narrow. Fortunately, 
the FBI, and, in Francesa's eyes, God himself, gave him another chance to make something of himself. He was asked, on behalf of a number of major American sports leagues, to help produce an anti-gambling PSA. While it was hardly his biggest source of income, Francais knew how gambling debts could be used as leverage to get athletes to fix games, similar to Burke's racket. Francais continued to give anti-gambling talks in person after his release. Telling the OC Register, he was hired by the MLB to give this message to every team during 1996's spring training, then getting a similar deal from the NBA. In the following years, he would broaden his horizons by becoming a full-blown Christian motivational speaker. Videos of his talks at churches over the years are on YouTube, where he delivers an abbreviated story of his criminal history and redemption, mixed in with observations on life and scripture. You need to challenge the Bible. You need to be 100% sure. You need to stand up a God who's ready to stand up to you back and say, Lord, prove it to me, because he wants to make a believer out of you. When I opened my heart and my mind to the Lord and I challenged him, I found out that there is more evidence to prove that the Bible is truly the word of God and that Jesus is the risen Savior than there is for anything else that exists on the face of the earth. And I mean that. This new life as a public figure has even given him some inroads back into show business. In 1997, he produced an all-star hip-hop concert at the former Alcatraz prison that would be used as a fundraiser pay-per-view. And in 2018, he was hired as the narrator of A Mob Story, a stage musical that premiered in Las Vegas. Even though his testimony was inconsequential to the mob, Francais still believed Carmine Persico wanted him dead for breaking his oath to the Columbos, and that his father reluctantly acceded to the hit. Ed McDonald said in 1992, he had reason to believe Francais paid off the mafia to let him leave. More likely, given the other problems the mobs had since the mid-80s, they simply have better things to do than go after Michael Francais. In a 2016 talk at Victory Outreach San Diego, Francais told the crowd if he hadn't been violated in 91, he probably would have died in Arena's attempted coup. My dad sent me a message, stop the baloney, Mike. We need you back here. You gotta come back. My hand to God. I was ready to tell my wife, I gotta go back to New York. I didn't wanna tell her why. The day before I was going to tell her, I got violated and sent back. How serious is that? 13 guys were murdered and 32 guys went to prison for life during that war. Today, out of that list of 50, some 30 years later, 46 of those men are dead. Three of them that I know of are doing life in prison without parole, and I'm here for one purpose and one purpose only, and that's to give praise and honor and glory to my Lord and Savior and my hero, my hero in life, Jesus Christ. Besides, if you were Carmine Persico's successor, and decided to suffer the blowback that would come from whacking a high-profile defector, would you go after Michael Frances, who played chicken with actually testifying, or his brother John Jr., an unsuccessful associate who the FBI talked into coming out of rehab to wear a wire on his father? Henry Hill would be another improbable mob survivor. Paul Vario and Jimmy Burke died in prison in 1988 and 1996 respectively, allowing him to live more openly until he passed away in 2012. When production for Goodfellas began, he was paid $480,000 for the rights to his life story. Most of this went to paying off old debts. But in his new career as a mob storyteller, there were more scores to come. His trickle of royalties for Wise Guy was cut off under New York's original Son of Sam law, written to keep criminals from profiting from the stories of their crimes. But a lawsuit by Simon & Schuster resulted in the U.S. Supreme Court striking the law down in 1991. Hill would go on to write three books of his own after the turn of the century. The Wise Guy Cookbook, A Goodfellas Guide to New York, and his autobiography, Gangsters and Goodfellas. As the primary author of these books, 
Hale had a free hand to improbably insert John Gotti into his story as the killer of his colleague Tommy DeSimone. And, with his ex-wife Karen still in hiding, his claim that she had an affair with Paul Vario went unchallenged. A collaboration with author Daniel Simone also secured Hill a posthumous co-author credit for his 2015 book, The Lufthansa Heist. Reviewers for NPR and Publishers Weekly found its revelations underwhelming and had little patience for the purple prose. He also marketed a homemade tomato sauce and dabbled in art. Like Michael Frances, Henry Hill found an unconventional outlet to tell his story, albeit a very different one. He became a regular caller and guest on The Howard Stern Show, where his shelf life as shock jock entertainment was extended by his continued alcoholism. As he explained near the end of Gangsters and Goodfellas, I usually call when I've fallen off the wagon and feeling like I want to talk to somebody. Thank you.